Okay, seems like uh, you can hear me loud and clear. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be opening the last day of Next Cloud Conference, and uh, I hope it's not too early in the morning for a Berlin crowd. Uh, my name is Felix Reda. I'm a former member of the European Parliament, and nowadays I'm a board member at the Open Knowledge Foundation Germany. And uh, throughout my political and activist life, I've been trying to convince governments to support uh, the open source ecosystem. And um, uh, we recently at Open Knowledge Foundation have some success to report uh, in this uh, field, and namely that is the creation of the Sovereign Tech Fund, which is what I want to talk about today, and why, in my view, uh, software is part of a public service and therefore uh, part of the original um, tasks that any government should follow. And uh, when I've been talking to people about their expectation of what government uh, should be doing or what government is doing, um, I've met uh, sometimes a lot of uh, frustration or not very high expectations. So a lot of people might say, well, the, the core task of government is to tell us what to do. It's kind of the, the monopoly on the exercise of power. So basically, um, people sometimes have yeah, kind of a, a negative view towards uh, government as mostly restricting our possibilities. But uh, at least in theory, uh, what government should be is basically a pooling of resources. It's all of us getting together and saying, okay, rather than every single person taking care of their own health care and their own infrastructure, their own uh, fire safety and so on, it's not just a lot fairer for everybody if we work together, but it's also a lot more efficient. And at the end of the day, this is also how uh, open source communities work, that basically by uh, all of us working together on a common project, um, we're not just going to have uh, better outcomes, but um, we are also going to decide together and have uh, common accountability. So in the case of uh, a country's government or uh, a region like the European Union, that uh, means that the government should uh, be serving all of us and be accountable to all of us, but also have uh, the important function of providing public infrastructure. So um, this means in the broadest sense, of course, things like road, things like uh, having access to uh, water supply and so on. But uh, in my view, it should also include the IT infrastructure, the internet, uh, the software that we all depend on for uh, public life to function. So uh, the kind of philosophy that I would like to see from government is uh, to use open source software, but also to uh, take responsibility for uh, open source software and contribute back to it. Um, I think in the recent years since the start of the pandemic, this has become a bigger problem because we um, have really seen a sort of uh, rapid transformation of a lot of areas that used to be pretty um, offline, like the education system, but also a lot of um, businesses and public administrations that were not necessarily used to collaborating online, um, having to improvise and move to digital solutions in a pretty uh, short time frame, which uh, has not just been an opportunity for open source software, but quite often it also meant um, that uh, companies, public administrations, uh, schools, and so on, just picked whatever software solution looked uh, the most available to them and was often conflicting with their own uh, data protection or, or data security standards and was just used because it was there. Um, so while the government has been fairly good at taking care of uh, analog infrastructures, um, you can sometimes see that uh, nobody gets re-elected for making sure that maintenance of bridges and things is happening. So it's not always the top priority of governments to, um, to invest in maintenance, but rather um, the topic of, of maintaining infrastructure becomes more important when something goes wrong, like if a bridge collapses, for example. And in a way, uh, the story of the digital public goods 
um, is quite similar to the analog public goods. So you have a lot of infrastructure that is uh, not being properly maintained or that is relying very heavily on a small number of uh, volunteers to do so who are not getting the recognition that they deserve and also not necessarily the support. And um, so in my political career, there have been two instances where I've been able to convince government uh, to invest more heavily in open source software. One of those was pretty much immediately after the Heartbleed vulnerability in 2014. And the second one was uh, last year after uh, the lock for shell vulnerability. So in both cases, kind of a bridge has to collapse before government really takes an interest in the subject. But at least we're able to um, make use of those opportunities when kind of what we all know about what uh, is missing uh, actually makes it to the mainstream news, makes it uh, to um, uh, what non-technical politicians would actually hear about in the newspaper. Um, the problem that we're trying to address with the Sovereign Tech Fund has been uh, very well summarized by uh, this XKCD comic, uh, which I think at this point has become somewhat of a cliche. Uh, it's being shown so many times, but it is really the perfect illustration of the problem. So there you have this uh, stack of building blocks which represents uh, modern digital infrastructure, and then everything is balancing on this one tiny building block uh, which represents uh, a core infrastructure project in this case uh, that in, uh, in this example a random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. And when I show this to politicians, uh, they sometimes uh, think that this is a little bit of an exaggeration, that it's not really just one person sitting there in their basement uh, who is doing all the work. Like why would they even do that? What, what is their uh, <laughs> motivation to do so? But uh, this is actually uh, pretty much uh, not an exaggeration, but a f perfect illustration of the problem that we're trying to solve. So in real life, uh, it might look something like this. So this is uh, the, um, Daniel Stenberg, the maintainer and uh, developer of Curl, um, which uh, really is being used by all kinds of software projects for data transfers. And in this case here, you have an interview from um, uh, just about a little over a year ago where he's been uh, yeah, explaining in a podcast how over 25 years um, uh, he has um, really kind of become this little building block that everybody else uh, is, is building their infrastructure on. And uh, a little later, um, Apple very uh, uh, thankfully described what we call the free rider problem in open source software by uh, referring somebody who had a tech support issue, uh, rather like don't ask us, a multi-billion dollar company, please uh, ask the tech support of Curl, which is one person. Um, so uh, yeah, it's very much not an exaggeration. And um, I think we should all be kind of worried what happens if uh, Daniel gets run over by a bus, uh, God forbid, uh, that you know, we have to think before something bad happens about the long-term um, viability, the long-term sustainability of our IT infrastructure. And having open source uh, is great. It means that everybody can contribute to it, everybody can check the security of it, but it doesn't mean that this actually happens in practice. So we have to make sure that um, if all of us benefit from this software, that actually all of us are also uh, contributing to its maintenance. And this is really the core government function. This is what governments are here to do, to make sure that if something benefits everybody, that all of us are contributing to its uh, future sustainability. So in the past, um, at uh, the Open Knowledge Foundation, we have um, uh, tried to support uh, the open source infrastructure uh, through government funding. So basically by building public funds that are run by civil society groups such as us, but where um, uh, the government is contributing financially. So on Saturday, you may have heard uh, my colleague uh, Marie Gutbub talk about the Prototype Fund, which is uh, one such initiative that we run at the Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, the Prototype Fund uh, is uh, 
a really kind of um, low level, easy ac access um, way of supporting new projects in the open source field. So basically, if you have an idea and you want to get from that first idea to the first uh, prototype within a short time frame, so something like three to six months, um, you can apply to the prototype fund. Uh, you're not going to spend hours on the application process, and then you can get money, but also practical support with things like bureaucracy to make uh, that first prototype happen. Um, so this is obviously a great program, but um, its limitation is that since this is supported by the, the Ministry of Education and Innovation, the idea is, okay, you have to provide uh, something new. There has to be an innovation, there has to be a prototype. So this is not uh, designed as an instrument that actually helps with maintenance. And uh, quite often it's also more difficult to convince politics of uh, investing in maintenance because th at the end of the funding project they want to be able to show, look, this is the great new thing that we developed. And if it's really just, well, we made sure that nothing bad happened, uh, it's, it's a more difficult sell. So we need uh, something in addition to the prototype fund. Um, looking at uh, what, what else is out there, um, we've also uh, come across the Open Technology Fund, which is uh, also a great program that we all benefit from, which um, is financed by the US Congress, but still um, a lot of governments in the EU, a lot of companies and definitely civil society all over the world benefit from the existence of this program because it has provided financial support to the messaging app Signal, to uh, the browser Tor, to WireGuard, the VPN software. So a lot of things that are really critical for secure and censorship-free communications. Um, and also a lot of infrastructure that uh, end users rarely see. So you, you might say, well, okay, we have the Open Technology Fund, um, everything is fine, then we don't necessarily need um, European governments to build something on top of that. But the problem um, that we saw two years ago when we came up uh, with the idea for the Sovereign Tech Fund was uh, that in the case of the Open Technology Fund, there's also a single point of failure. So at the time, in 2020, uh, Donald Trump uh, tried to defund the Open Technology Fund. So there was an attack from Donald Trump for political reasons to try to get this program shut down. And uh, he was unsuccessful with this, luckily, but um, there was a short period of a couple of months where we didn't know whether the Open Technology Fund would continue to exist. And it shows, um, well, at the same time, a lot of governments in Europe were talking about so-called digital sovereignty. So this is this idea that we shouldn't make ourselves dependent on a single point of failure, whether it's a, a single government or a single large technology company, but rather we should uh, really build um, a decentralized infrastructure with lots of small companies, lots of different uh, public service uh, infrastructures, and also, for example, governments shouldn't um, basically have to shut down tomorrow if their Microsoft Office suite doesn't work. So that's kind of the, the basic idea that everybody was talking about. At the time, uh, the German government was in charge of the, president of the uh, presidency of the council at EU level, and they even had digital sovereignty as one of their goals uh, at the time. So we were uh, able to point at this attack on the Open Technology Fund in the US and said, look, um, the US is paying $20 million a year for the, the uh, provision of the Open Technology Fund. This is maybe a lot of money to us, but it's not a lot of money to a government. Any European government could easily provide that money and create redundancy. So a lot of different funding programs uh, that would be able to um, continue supporting the ecosystem uh, if something fails, if, for example, a program like the Open Technology Fund gets shut down. So um, we entered into a dialogue. Back then it was still uh, the old German government uh, consisting of conservatives and social democrats. And um, uh, we were able to convince them to commission a study from us where we were basically making the case for why we need such a, a funding program in Germany and in Europe. and. Um, uh, this first step was kind of encouraging. We were able to start uh, working on the study, and there was also a promise um, from the new government. So we had elections uh, at the end of 2021, and just after the new government uh, entered 
uh, uh, into government, uh, the Greens who are uh, in charge of the Ministry of Economy, uh, one day before Christmas tweeted, we're going to have a, a sovereign tech fund next year. So we were quite happy about this. Um, but then uh, the... Uh, the draft budget for 2022 came out and there was actually no money allocated to the sovereign tech fund, which uh, was a little bit of a setback because obviously you can't uh, promise to start uh, a funding program and then not allocate any money to it. But uh, after a concerted lobbying effort, we were able to convince the parliament to uh, provide 3.5 million euros this year. And uh, the good news is that for next year, the draft budget is out, and this time they didn't forget the sovereign tech fund. So next year, there's going to be uh, 10 million euros available in uh, uh, the budget to make sure that uh, the sovereign tech fund is going to be able to support uh, open source uh, technologies. So I want to present to you a few of the uh, results of this feasibility study that we did uh, for the Ministry of Economy last year. So um, uh, this was done by uh, several people who have worked both on the prototype fund but also on the open technology fund and it was hosted uh, with us at the Open uh, Knowledge Foundation. And um, the studies offers did uh, expert interviews with different people in the um, open source community and also held two workshops um, to gather input for this. And um, the funding model that we designed was built on the experience of both the Open Technology Fund and the Prototype Fund. So one of these principles that we learned from these existing funding structures is that it must be really easy to apply to because uh, the people who are good at writing um, code are not necessarily good at writing funding applications. They might also see it as a waste of time. If you don't know whether you're actually going to get funding at the end, um, the first kind of contact to the program must be really low effort so you don't end up um, you know, spending a lot of time on an application and then finding out that this is actually not the right funding source for you. Um, there has to be very low overhead, so we wanted to avoid that the government um, pays some consultancy that is not really uh, integrated in the open source community that doesn't really know how uh, open source logic works, um, but rather that uh, the, the fund should be run by people coming from the community, from civil society. And um, it should not be limited to innovative projects, but really uh, focus on the maintenance and uh, usability improvements in open source software um, to get funding. There should also be a focus on sustainability. So this is especially a, prog a problem with uh, projects that have one or two core maintainers. Uh, they might have uh, life changes. You know, they might uh, take on a new job. They might have a baby. They might have some other reason why they uh, may not uh, be able to maintain uh, the software forever. So there needs to be support for projects to come up with a long-term sustainability plan. And um, it's also really important that um, the government should be providing the funding for it, but there should not be a centralized kind of government decision making over which projects to fund, because then it would be extremely vulnerable to, um, for example, only funding the things that are easily explained to non technical people or that have some application in whatever is in the news that week, but rather um, there should be no expectation that uh, this funding instrument would be used for promoting this particular government's um, policies, for example, because ideally this fund should exist longer than any one particular government. And so um, it should just become as natural for the government to fund this uh, as it is natural to pay for the maintenance of bridges or for fire services. Um, uh, finally, uh, this sounds kind of um, logical and shouldn't really deserve mentioning, but it's sometimes a problem when it comes to government funding. It should be possible to pay individuals, and it shouldn't matter what nationality those individuals have. So you shouldn't have to have a German tax ID in order to be able to receive this funding, because of course a lot of open source uh, communities are really international, and they don't always have a company behind it or an association that can actually receive the funding. So, um, uh, for the Sovereign Tech Fund, um, uh, 
we identified what is really needed is to focus on what we call open digital based technology. So not necessarily user facing um, kind of uh, end user software, but uh, uh, looking at, okay, what does this end user software need in terms of interoperability, in terms of programming languages, in terms of libraries. So um, what we mean by open digital basic technologies is um, technologies that enable the creation and execution of software. So everything that is sort of one layer below that, uh, where a vulnerability would really have um, also a drastic effect on IT security, but uh, where the maintenance also benefits lots of different companies, lots of different projects that are building on top of that. So that means um, uh, anything that is required for operating the internet and other communications media, security tools uh, like certificates, but also um, uh, things like compilers, libraries, programming languages, operating systems, and so on. And um, uh, we think that uh, funding these uh, open digital based technologies is going to support the entire ecosystem, but the target groups of where the actual funding would go would be uh, the maintainers and contributors on the one hand, uh, or intermediaries who are providing services to them. So for example, designers or um, uh, security auditors that might help those uh, developers improve their products. Um, before, uh, we actually made the proposal for what exactly the funding should look like. We had to do a mapping. So basically look at what is already out there in order to be able to convince the government that there uh, is a need, that there is a lack for funding for these open digital based technology. So um, what we ended up doing was uh, to look at 44 different funding programs in the technology field and looked at whether they are suitable to um, uh, support the maintenance of these open digital based technologies. And we found um, that out of those 44, in principle 26 of them uh, it would be possible for such projects to get funding, but most of those 26 didn't actually explicitly mention that they wanted to focus on infrastructure or that they wanted to focus on maintenance. So if we actually looked at, okay, which ones of these funding programs actually have the goal of supporting those, uh, there were only five left. And out of those five, there were only two that actually offered financial support directly to the projects, uh, one of them being the Open Technology Fund uh, in the US, which uh, we already mentioned, um, has a certain weakness to political pressure. We really hope that what happened under Trump is not going to repeat itself. But uh, clearly, having this one program is not enough to say, OK, the open source ecosystem is safe. And it's also a fairly small pro program with $20 million a year. And the second one being an LNET in the Netherlands, um, where at the time of the study, it also looked like it might be phased out in the future. So uh, the results of this mapping exercise showed um, that uh, to the extent that there are funding programs for open source software, they um, either don't focus on maintenance and safeguarding of existing software, so quite often they uh, fund innovation, or um, if they are uh, uh, able to fund maintenance of basic technologies, the funding designs of these programs doesn't necessarily fit what is needed. So for example, they might not be able to um, directly support the communities or you would have a really cumbersome application process and so on. So um, having identified that there is a need for a sovereign tech fund, um, we made a proposal for what it should look like. So what should the funding modalities be? And our proposal says that there should be a possibility for individual projects to receive between 15,000 and uh, 500,000 euros over a du duration of six to 24 months. So this was kind of... Um, uh, arrived at on the basis of the experience from the prototype fund, which is at the lower end of this spectrum. So um, uh, the prototype fund provides just under 50,000 euros uh, over a period of six months. And on the other end, the core infrastructure fund, which is part of the open technology fund, which um, provides up to 500,000 euros in um, uh, yeah, extreme cases. 
and the expectation is that most of the projects would be somewhere in the middle of that, but it shouldn't be structurally excluded that there might be particularly really uh, maintenance intensive, intensive projects that might need uh, more support. And in terms of the duration, it really depends what you need. So for example, if you have a single developer working in a company um, who wants to take a sabbatical, so to speak, so sometime where uh, they are freed from their day-to-day -day tasks in the company and really want to focus on improving or building a new functionality for an open source tool that the company can use but then gets also um, fed back into the ecosystem, six months might be the ideal uh, period to do that. Um, and then the expectation is that sort of the maintenance um, of uh, this project would also continue to be part of their tasks, but you would basically pay a company to set aside time for a person to work on something like this. Um, whereas 24 months is more suitable if you have a project that wants to do long-term planning and kind of come up with um, uh, long-term viability, maybe also uh, apply for future grants, but not have to stop development um, uh, after a certain period because they've run out of funding. Um, in terms of the financial volume, um, we applied or recommended that there should be 10 million euros a year uh, support from the government, which is also what we now uh, are going to receive for 2023. And um, this is based on an estimation that um, uh, we would like to be able to fund a maximum of 30 projects a year, um, where an average funding amount could be around a quarter of a million. And uh, the additional money would um, go towards uh, support measures. So these additional support measures um, are non-monetary things that a free software project might need. Uh, for example, legal advice or uh, security audits um, that would be conducted by selected partners that the Sovereign Tech Fund would also put the projects in contact with. Um, uh, for example, uh, advice on developing such a sustainability strategy, uh, usability improvements, communication, and so on. And the idea is uh, here that the Sovereign Tech Fund would have uh, sort of a portfolio of those additional support measures that would be continuously updated based on the communication with the projects, see what they actually need, and then regularly adapt these additional support measures. And in terms of uh, recipients, we really want to provide um, support for the whole breadth from a single individual developer to a company um, and nonprofit association and everything in between. And uh, very importantly, it should be possible to fund uh, beyond one country, beyond one region, uh, in order to also correspond to the way that uh, open source software is actually being developed. Um, so the funding recipients um, should uh, be individuals, because in some cases this is the only funding recipient there is, especially with uh, a lot of smaller projects. There is no company behind uh, an open source tool. There is no non-profit association. So you don't actually have a legal person to work with, but rather individuals uh, who might be recipients of the Sovereign Tech Fund support. Um, but there should also be a possibility for organizations and communities to form uh, with the support of the Sovereign Tech Fund. So this could take the, the uh, form of a foundation or a non-profit. So in, in Germany, you might have Eingetragener Verein. In other countries, you might, other, might have other legal forms. Um, the funding should also, in principle, it should be possible to go to companies. There, usually the idea would be that the Sovereign Tech Fund would subsidize um, a staff position at a company and then that staffer as part of their core tasks would uh, maintain a particular open source um, project and provide uh, contributions to it as part of their regular work time. Um, and finally, uh, some of the funding could also go to service providers such as security auditors or designers who are working on improving open source projects. So uh, now in 2022, so two years after um, the idea was basically first formulated by us and we started uh, uh, writing to politicians, we started uh, talking about this idea, writing in the press and so on. Now the Sovereign Tech Fund has actually been founded. So uh, the, the budget for 2022 has been adopted by the government 
and the Sovereign Tech Fund is now incubated at Sprint. Uh, Sprint is the German Federal Agency for Disruptive Innovation, and they're basically saying, <laughs> look, if you, if you want to have innovation, um, you have to have this infrastructure in place, because this is basically what we're all building on. So we were able to convince uh, a rather innovation-minded government that maintenance and uh, infrastructure is actually part of their core task. Um, I'm now kind of out of the picture, so at Open Knowledge Foundation we provided this study, we provided the idea, we're not actually running the Sovereign Tech Fund. So the Sovereign Tech Fund is now with Sprint and is being run by Adriana Gro and Fiona Krakenburger, whom you can see here, um, both of them uh, worked at uh, Open Knowledge Foundation Germany uh, and, and or the uh, Open Technology Fund in the past. So they have this kind of uh, own practical experience with running the prototype fund, running the Open Technology Fund, and are now uh, in charge of the Sovereign Tech Fund at Sprint. Um, this is their mission statement. So um, what is needed is uh, for the development, improvement, and maintenance of these open digital, uh, open basic digital space is a sovereign tech fund. And the goal is to sustainably strengthen the open source ecosystem with a focus on security, resilience, technological diversity, and the people behind the projects. So what does this mean? First of all, maintenance is very important. So the Sovereign Tech Fund, unlike a lot of other funding projects, um, focuses not only on the development of new technologies, but really on the maintenance and improvement of existing software standards, libraries, and so on. Um, open digital basic technologies are what is being funded by the Sovereign Tech Fund. So this means um, uh, the software components on the basis of which new applications can be developed and of course uh, the, the open digital basic technologies that are being funded should be highly relevant for the ecosystem as a whole. Um, sustainability means um, that after the funding period ends, um, the project shouldn't kind of uh, be left with nothing, but rather the funding period should be used to really think about long-term strategies, how um, can uh, the project exist and be funded also beyond the end of this uh, initial funding period. Um, resilience means, uh, on the one hand, IT security, so there should be a focus on uh, improving uh, the security of open source comp uh, components, but also technological diversity, so basically um, there should be different uh, alternatives for the same task. There should be interoperability between those different alternatives. And uh, all of this, we argue, would contribute to the government goals of digital sovereignty that basically means uh, in this, in this uh, context uh, the independent and self-determined use of technology, not just by the government, but also by companies or by individuals. And finally, the focus on people. Um, we think is also really important because at the end of the day, uh, uh, a lot of open source software development is going to continue to be intrinsically motivated and that is a good thing. So we don't want um, uh, by basically injecting money into a project, um, sideline the volunteers and we don't want to kill the volunteer spirit behind a lot of uh, open source projects. So it's really about talking to the projects and finding out what it is that they actually need. And this may not always be direct funding in, in the sense of money, but it could also be training, it could also be support um, with more administrative tasks and not the actual coding. So uh, the goal is really for the Sovereign Tech Fund to be in a direct um, uh, conversation with uh, the developers and find out what kind of support they really need most. So uh, we are now in the phase of the pilot round. This means uh, later this month, uh, the Sovereign Tech Fund is going to officially launch its pilot phase. So in this pilot phase, basically, um, the team of the Sovereign Tech Fund has picked a very small number of projects uh, to test the methodology. So basically, these are um, um, maintainers or organizations of uh, open digital basic technologies that are going to receive part of this uh, initial funding, um, which is smaller for this year, to basically test out um, how the process works. Like, um, uh, there, there is uh, 
broader theory of what the funding mechanism is going to look like in the future. This is currently being built and to make sure that um, this actually works in practice, sort of this pilot round is going to run uh, in parallel to the development of this, um, uh, this methodology. So next year, the Sovereign Tech Fund is going to go out of beta, so to speak. Um, it's going to be important to convince politicians based on this pilot round that the Sovereign Tech Fund is something that is needed and uh, that is working. And then the goal for next year is to implement the full methodology. So this is kind of what it's going to look like. Um, basically, um, the, at the core of the Sovereign Tech Fund, there is going to be a database of um, critical open digital basic technologies. And uh, this database is going to be filled um, by free, uh, two, two methods, basically. One is that uh, the members of the Sovereign Tech Fund team are going to actively um, go into the communities, talk to people, talk to projects, and find out um, uh, through a quantitative and qualitative analysis, what are critical components that are sort of under-maintained or that need support. And then in parallel to that, there is going to be just a regular open application process uh, the way that uh, you might be used to it from other funding projects. So it's basically going to be possible to apply next year to the Sovereign Tech Fund with your project. Um, but the idea is that uh, this should not be the only way that people learn about the Sovereign Tech Fund. So uh, one possibility is that you apply. The other possibility might be that uh, you get approached by people who uh, are part of the Sovereign Tech Fund team. So based on this database, then um, the Sovereign Tech Fund team is going to look at, OK, who is the natural home for this project? So if it's, um, let's say, uh, an open source project that is basically being maintained by one person, it's pretty logical that that is going to be the person that should be a, a funding or support recipient for that. But if it's a broader project where you have a mixture of individuals, organizations, and companies all contributing to it, part of this uh, scouting process is to find out who is a, a good implementation partner. And this could be individual developers, it could be a team, it could be an agency, but it could also be a company that receives a grant um, that is then going to uh, allow their on-staff developers to work on the project. So basically, you're going to have these two streams of both open applications from the outside and the scouting process from the inside um, to then hopefully be able to fund up to 30 projects with the Sovereign Tech Fund next year. So this is kind of uh, what uh, hopefully is going to unfold over the next year. Um, I invite you to keep up to date, uh, especially when it comes to the announcement of the pilot phase, which is um, yeah, going to happen later this month. You can learn about that at sovereigntechfund.de. There's also an English version available. And um, get in touch with the Sovereign Tech Fund team directly, which I'm no longer a part of. If uh, you're kind of interested more generally in how to convince politicians how to do something like this, also feel free to get to uh, in touch with me directly through Twitter or through my email address. So uh, I hope um, that this is uh, encouraging news for you. And um, uh, also, I think uh, the Sovereign Tech Fund team is going to um, depend very heavily on kind of feedback from the community um, how this should be developed in the future. So I thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, if there are any questions and follow up, uh, feel free to approach me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix, for this insightful presentation, for introducing the Sovereign Tech Fund and talking to us about software as a public service. If there's any questions, I'm very happy to come up to you and Felix to answer them. Uh, will the database of eligible software projects be uh, on the website like so that you can see which they consider? Um, so basically, I think... Um, they want to use the methodology of the Open Technology Fund. I think they have something like this where um, basically the methodology, the software, and so on is made open source. I'm not sure if they have decided on uh, how this database is going to be presented, um, but I encourage you to kind of 
Yeah, keep a look out for that. I, I, I think also not everything is decided yet in detail because um, they need to uh, basically w work with the government to find out, okay, what is the government able to do and so on. Um, I hope it's going to be as transparent as possible. Thank you. Uh, are you aware of uh, other initiative from uh, other European governments? Um, so I know that uh, the French government, um, which had the um, council presidency at EU level at the first half of this year, um, they ran an initiative on the digital commons. And as part of that, they kind of um, made a study where they collected examples, like what are different governments doing for the digital commons. And there was definitely a lot of interest in the sovereign tech fund. Um, usually things happen relatively slowly. I know that uh, at EU level, um, when I was in the European Parliament, uh, the European Commission um, uh, supported uh, security of open source software and at the time uh, we mostly did this as bug bounties and I think part of that is still running, not necessarily because bug bounties are the most um, uh, ideal or useful uh, way, especially when it comes to kind of long-term sustainability, but at the time it was more because it's easier for a government to pay and a company that runs bug bounties than it is to pay individuals. And this has to do more with the funding rules because uh, governments have to be very strictly accountable over how they spend their money and so on. I hope um, that the Sovereign Tech Fund is going to show other governments how to do this, like how you can pay uh, funding to individuals or to small projects without uh, breaking any uh, public tender rules, funding rules and so on and um, then hopefully other uh, governments that are interested in this will be able to copy uh, the methodology. This is definitely sort of the idea. The Sovereign Tech Fund wants to be copied um, because, yeah, it, it 10 million euros is uh, a lot, but it's definitely not going to cover the entire need. So hopefully other governments that have sort of said nice things about it, like the French government will actually take it uh, as an example and maybe create their own versions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is great what you do, uh, indeed. I, however, I see kind of an elephant in the room, and let's name it, it's GitHub. It's a privately owned, uh, freely available uh, place where a lot of open source projects are running at the moment. And for the resilience of uh, the open source movement as a whole, this is probably one of the areas that would need to be addressed as well. Yeah, I agree. I think um, the uh, European Union has paid a lot of attention more recently to, to issues of competition. So we have uh, the Digital Markets Act, um, which is a new law that kind of puts some obligations, for example, on app stores, uh, because there is a recognition that there is a huge market concentration in something that we all need um, if we want to operate a modern smartphone, for example. Um, but I feel like with GitHub, uh, politics were not really there yet at the time to, to even, first of all, know what a repository is, and then to know that it might be a problem if the biggest one is owned by a private company, even, or especially a company of the size of Microsoft. So, I, I mean, we can't really turn back the clock on that. Uh, I think it's a reality now. I think, of course, individual um, open source projects can try to, to also build some uh, uh, redundancy and also host their code elsewhere. But of course, this is extremely cumbersome. If everybody is kind of used uh, to, to using GitHub, it's not, well, it's very difficult for an individual project to move away from that or to build redundancy. Um, but I hope that in the future, uh, competition law is also going to uh, pay attention to that. So, I mean, as long as GitHub stays open, um, it's it's 
sort of working, but if I think, for example, if Microsoft decided to make changes to the policies of GitHub, that would be really harmful to the open source community or to the public interest. I think that uh, governments and, and competition law should also step in there. Um, I don't think it's necessarily something that the Sovereign Tech Fund can address because I feel this is more of a regulation uh, issue than a funding issue, but it's definitely something that we should keep a lookout for. Any other questions? Yeah. Arthur. Hi, thanks. Um, a question that goes into a similar direction, but rather than on uh, yeah, our small computers in our pockets. So what about this duopoly of, of um, yeah, Google and uh, Apple on, on the smartphone market? Is there also maybe initiatives or maybe it's also the fund um, useful for companies and communities um, to yeah, drive forward the Linux uh, smartphones? Um, so I would say uh, that the definition of open digital basic technologies is sort of uh, large enough to also encompass something like that as part of infrastructure. I think um, we have to be careful uh, to make sure that there is enough sort of focus on maintenance simply because there are very few other funding projects that focus on maintenance and um, building something new um, building alternatives, uh, I think, is also really important. But, um, yeah, I think there we have to kind of look at um, the balance inside of the Sovereign Tech Fund. So uh, something else that I think might be relevant for this um, uh, is, once again, the Digital Markets Act, which um, at least um, forbids uh, software operating systems from... Um, kind of creating a monopoly of application stores. So they will have to allow alternative application stores to, to the Google Play Store and uh, uh, the Apple um, Store. And um, I've been kind of trying to encourage the European Commission to also think about what that means because um, it was a little bit of a, an ironic situation where the EU had said, okay, uh, you need to have alternatives to uh, to the two large app stores, but then even the European Union itself wasn't um, uh, even offering its own applications, like for EU, uh, like EU-funded applications for government services outside of the major Play Store. So this is something um, that uh, is now being proposed by the European Parliament. Also, an idea that. Uh, that uh, we contributed to, um, to at least kind of make sure that uh, public service applications are actually going to be available, like in F-Droid store or outside of the big Play stores. Um, so yeah, I would say in principle, it should be possible to apply with um, things like that to the Sovereign Tech Fund, um, or even the Prototype Fund, if it's something that, is, that doesn't even exist yet. Because uh, the idea with the Sovereign Tech Fund is less to, to fund the creation of entirely new projects, but rather um, to help maintain and improve already existing ones. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for that presentation. Um, I had a question about the five uh, last good projects that were available for that. Um, uh, sorry, about what? In your presentation, uh, there was like this graph with uh, various uh, potential available projects that would fit uh, the prototype fund, not prototype fund, the fund. You uh, mean we this went to one? No, a bit later, it was circles. There was multiple uh, intricated circles, and we ended up ah, with yeah. only two uh, the that programs. were really fitting. This yeah, one? Yeah, exactly uh -huh. this one. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you had uh, a few names in which project would actually uh, wear in that. Yeah, uh, um, so yeah. yeah. So if you go to sovereigntechfund.de, uh, um, you can download the entire study and you're going to find uh, a slide that looks pretty much like this with a, a lot more text. Uh, <laughs> but uh, basically, we've included all of these 44 uh, funding projects in the annex of the study. So you can, you can look exactly at uh, which projects were considered and why uh, we thought that they don't provide what, what we're trying to do with the Sovereign Tech Fund. 
Yeah, and this also applies uh, to to other details like uh, the funding modalities and this uh, this flow chart and so on. Um, this is all part of the study um, that you can download at sovereigntechfund.de. It's available in German and English, and um, yeah, the it, it's kind of the basis for for what uh, the Sovereign Tech Fund is planning for next year, Wishprint. Most definitely interesting reading materials then. Are there any other questions for Felix? I don't see any. So it's time for me to say thank you very much, Felix. It was an absolute pleasure to have you. Thanks for your time and um, the very useful information that you gave us this morning. Thank, thank you. you.